Uh, my name is Avinash Shanbhag, and if you didn't know, but this suit is a giveaway, I do work for the US government, so we are the federal agency. Uh, I work for the Office of National Coordinator for Health IT. And I should mention, Reen did let me know that DevDays was a casual affair, but I had to wear a suit just so that, you know, <laughs> if, if a picture ever gets taken. But I appreciate you all coming in here. And uh, hopefully in the morning, you got a great talk from Keith talking about just the health IT industry and, and just the ROIs on it. What I wanted to take the next about 30, 40 minutes to talk about a little bit about government's perspective and, and what we are doing to set the course for what we boldly put in as a 21st century digital healthcare system. Clearly, uh, we are going to be doing it all together. So it, it's really a, a collaboration between government and uh, private sector. Uh, at a high level, again, you know, knowing, knowing there are only a few things that you remember in this uh, at, at any given point, I wanted to start with providing some of the ONC's thoughts on fire. And clearly, uh, we are here in full force because ONC believes in, 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 in fire first policy. And again, over the last 10, 12 years, as uh, some of the previous speakers have talked about, the transition of, of fire being developed as part of the Argonaut project, making it into certification, all that has led us to, to a kind of a, a place where whenever we have policy objectives that government is looking at, we do look at fire standards, fire implementers, and all of you are really important enough to make those policy objectives come, come true. So again, this is an area of where we firmly believe that, that, that fire is one of the modern technology stacks that we need to work on. Uh, again, we, we are a regulator, but we also are a coordinator. So hopefully in the next 20, 30 minutes, I'll talk a little bit about how ONC as a small agency within HHS works with our operating divisions, the, the big uh, HHS uh, operating divisions like CDC, CMS, to help coordinate fire activities so that as implementers and developers, you all can have a, a single voice of implementation that you can work towards as opposed to having different agencies asking you for uh, nearly the same thing but slightly different that makes it challenging for, for all of us to implement. And finally, I'll go to, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our, our current work and, and upcoming work on trusted exchange framework and common agreement. This is the network level capabilities that Keith briefly alluded to. This is an area where we really think has the power to scale fire uh, across and, and more than what is currently done. And it can really be an additive uh, ability on top of certified EHRs that, that provide API capability. So really, I think we, we feel that a combination of fire APIs provided by EHRs, certified health IT, I'll kind of interchangeably mention those terms, uh, and having a, a network level fire capability is really going to build the foundation on which newer capabilities and really uh, end user capabilities can be built in. So looking forward to talking about that. Uh, briefly, I'll mention about uh, ONC. Uh, again, uh, this crowd, uh, we have heard a, a little bit from yesterday's education session by Virginia and then Josh Mendel, and we heard today, so, so hopefully all of you are aware. But just to kind of give you a context, uh, we were established in 2005, so we are about 2004, so we are about 20 years uh, as, as an agency, so young by, by federal agency standards, and we are charged with, with developing a federal health IT strategy for the entire, uh, entire country. So, Again, in the morning, uh, one of the biggest things that we, we worked on uh, was during the High Tech Act, which was one of the uh, questions that was asked in the morning that really uh, pushed ONC into the role of, certi of, of certifying electronic health records. And that's really the place where we got started developing all the certification requirements around standards. And as we heard in the morning, about $40 billion of incentives get put, got put into the US digital health IT marketplace, the EHR certification program. And I would say that over the first decade, which, which is like you can say the first round of High Tech Act 2009 to around 2020, the first decade of, of ONC's work, we have digitized the health, health information exchange. So really health IT, health care and health information has, has really uh, been digitized and we built a foundation. What we now need to do, which is this new decade, which really I'm excited about, is to now start leveraging this EHR that has built all the, fra all the, all the digitization of, of health information to leverage it to actually add value to patient care, to patients, to all of us, 
to, to basically make sure that healthcare becomes much more optimized and efficient. And really, looking at the stack in the morning on travel industry, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, we will not take as much time as the, the travel booking industry took to, to move from, 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 their, from old stack into their modern stack. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, mostly about the standards work and the work that ONC through our, regu our regulations have helped uh, promote, uh, because that really does uh, uh, connect with, the, with, with all of you. Uh, talk a little bit about the trusted exchange framework, and briefly, again, I won't talk a whole lot, but we also have were given the authority to, to manage behaviors within health in, within the EHRs. This is the information sharing rule or the information blocking rule that really we hope will help propel the behavior of, of providers, health IT exchanges, networks, and, and, and developers to make sure that, that data gets flowing so that you all who are really driving the industry can, can leverage the data for doing uh, the, the, the apps and, and, and really the, the value add services that is needed. Uh, ONC's core activities, just high level, bucketed into like these four areas. Uh, we are obviously the, the certifiers of uh, EHR technology or health IT broadly, so that's one of the, the main things that we do. We are certifying the cures, the, the 2015 edition cures update. That's really the first iteration of fire standards that came through our, uh, what, is, what is colloquially called the G API, G10 APIs. That, that's really being certified uh, through our program. We are gearing up to also support the, the implementation of our current latest rule, the HDI one rule that has requirements coming up uh, at the end of the year for some things around uh, publication of endpoints, but also in the next couple of years. Uh, TEFCA, I'll talk a little bit about it later, focus a lot about uh, health data standards because really we believe that the, the, the best ONC that as a government agency we can do is ensure that we are supportive of, of developing standards and one of the lev levers we use is United States Core Data of Interoperability that you heard uh, in, 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 in a previous session here, but I'll talk a little bit about that and then also some of our engagements, coordination activity with federal agencies. So now talking a little bit about FHIR and, and, and APIs, uh, it all started with the 21st Century Cures Act. It's literally in the law uh, that Congress passed in a bipartisan way in 2016 that they required ONC to develop regulations that publish, that required health IT developers to publish APIs that could be used, accessed, exchanged uh, without any special effort. So really, again, just to kind of set the context for, for many of you who are developers that uh, ONC didn't just dream about like, you know, requiring APIs within health IT uh, uh, products, but this was really, come, they came, it came about uh, through the 21st Century Cures Act. And it, this was in 2016, and as part of that uh, law, ONC in, in 2019 uh, published our Cures rule, uh, which has come live, which came live on, on December 31st, 2022. So for folks that are like, you know, like why isn't Fire APIs used? You know, they, I, we always hear the, 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 the conversation about Fire APIs are, are now published, are required by, by providers. Why aren't cool new applications being built? It's being leveraged. There are scalability issues. All of those things that we hear uh, will just reflect that it's really about a year since providers have gotten products that have really, uh, you know, have gotten those API endpoints. And, and in, in my humble opinion, it's, it's, it's growing pains around now requiring, uh, you know, just learning how to use those. But one of the key things that we find is now that those API endpoints are available, we really want developers like you who are to take advantage of it. Because again, once you'll use those APIs, you'll find all the, the, the weaknesses or, or gaps in it, which really will then be helpful for both uh, standards development organizations, which are really doing a great job of upgrading Fire API standards, uh, but also to ONC in, in, in really learning from you all where the, the Fire API standards should move forward from our levers that we have. So again, this is an area that we are excited about. And I again want to use this as an opportunity to thank all of our uh, certified health IT product developers because as you see in that blog, uh, when the deadline did pass, over 95% of our health IT developers had complied to the requirements, so they had products that had built towards the Fire API standards at that time. Uh, again, uh, just, just as you know, the first decade 
took us a while from 2012 to 2020, but we have created a, a cadence of, of a gradual and steady upgrade that hopefully enables developers to know what's coming in the future. And as part of that uh, work, uh, our recent published, published rule, the HTI-1 rule, uh, the health data technology and, and interoperability rule that we published in March, has some very uh, steady and, and deliberate upgrades to the standards that were in the QoS rules. So as you see from here, we moved from a US CDI version one to US CDI version three. Again, hopefully not a surprise to industry because you all had about two years of, of, of uh, time and we had also announced that as we progress with uh, upgrading US CDI, that, be that would become the new floor in future regulations. So what we now have in HTI-1 rule, which is some of these capabilities are required two years from now, and, and some of them at the end of the year, require updated US core uh, implementation guides, uh, which, which we will look, uh, work with uh, HL7 community to kind of update. Uh, there are also very important upgrades to the smart app launch uh, implementation guide, which really help apps connect with data holders uh, that are in provider settings. And really that's an important uh, connection that has helped ensure that, that patients are able to access data and, and, and providers are able to do B2B exchanges as needed. So again, uh, very important uh, areas of upgrade for us. And finally, I'll mention a little bit about our service URL requirements that have been updated. What we heard during the QoS rule, we, we had essentially a functional requirement at that time to publish a URL. And what we found is, App developers had a hard time mapping URLs with organizations that, that were really supporting those URLs, and it was very difficult for them to connect from technical endpoints to identifying which provider was supported by that. And again, as patients, we don't really, like, you know, we, we know our clinicians, we know our providers, we don't know whether it's in some fire API endpoint. So one of some of the things that we have done as required in HTI1 are starting to expand on this requirement to make it much more easily usable for industry to be able, for app developers to be able to use those uh, endpoints. And we actually took a lot of our motivation came from the patient access brands work or the user access brands work that has now been put into the smart app uh, launch IG. So again, a lot of synergies and hopefully none of it is a surprise to, to, to the regulated industry as you see us moving forward, hopefully it, 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 it makes sense and you are kind of following along. I'll briefly mention about our two Inferno toolkit, which is the testing uh, pro test tools that, uh, that ONC supports and builds. Again, we build it and support it both from a certification perspective, but also broadly to provide testing capabilities to newer IGs, implementation guides that are being built. Because again, we feel that and, and we learned over the past decade and so of our work that having robust, hardened implementation specifications go a long way in, in improving adoption, compliance of those implementation guides when they, if they ever get regulated. So again, here's a list of a whole lot of test kits that are currently available, but also I'm, I'm pleased to announce that actually today we are releasing a whole host of, uh, of, of test kits that are geared towards our payer community, the Da Vinci, uh, folks have been working on a, on a, a bunch of uh, implementation specifications to support payer provider uh, exchange of data and have created these implementation guides. Uh, excited to, to, to note that, that we, have, uh, we have published, we are publishing or we are actually going to be publishing uh, uh, by, by the end of the day uh, these toolkits. And if you are ever interested in, in uh, knowing more about it during the time you're here, please catch hold of uh, anybody from ONC team. We have actually our our G team and our Inferno testing team uh, that are partic participating in the dev day. So they'll be happy to provide you with additional insights on, 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 on what's uh, published and what's coming down the pipe. We are clearly also going to be working on uh, updating, uh, adding new toolkits in the public health IT exchange area also given its importance. Uh, I'll talk br very briefly about US CDI. Again, that's you all are very familiar with, with US CDI as the data policy uh, uh, driver by which ONC expands the, the required requirements for certified health IT to be able to capture, access, access, and exchange a certain set of data elements. And again, I think we talk broadly about US CDI being like the minimum data set for a healthcare, our US healthcare delivery system. Uh, over the past several years, we are now on 
We have four versions published. We are on version five, which uh, it, it, it's uh, anticipated to be released in July, so it's really uh, close to being completed. Uh, the, the, the great thing about it is we kind of have worked uh, to steadily expand it, and we reached this annual cadence of publishing USCDI that we feel industry is, is all of you are both expecting to uh, get it, but also anticipating, and, and hopefully there are no surprises, because one of the things that as federal agencies we want to do is avoid any last minute surprises on the regulated industry. And hopefully, uh, USCDI is this regular cadence of expansion that provides you that, that, that comfort that uh, as you build newer versions, they will come in July, there'll be a new version coming as a draft in the end of the year, and those things will get put into regulations over a certain cadence of time. So as, we, as I put in here, we have USCDI version three that is in HDI1 rules, so that is now required to be implemented by uh, health IT, certified health IT developers by, in two years, so by January 1, 2026, so hopefully you have a longer time uh, to, 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 uh, to implement that. And again, USCDI version five will come, and, and, and again, it will go through its normal progression. I did not mention uh, our ability to kind of build out newer versions to be permitted by industry to adopt through what we call as a, as a standards version advancement program. Now I'm going to switch gear a little bit and talk about, not as an ONC, as a regulator, but in a non-regulated environment, uh, primarily as our, uh, as, as our role as a coordinator. And one of the first things that I'm sure many of you have heard about is this US CDI Plus program. Again, it's not a streaming service, that's a premium service on top of US CDI, I'll just mention that. Uh, what it is, is, is our, our, our work with federal agencies that are all interested in, in getting their program-specific data, which is a little bit beyond US CDI. And again, as you know, US CDI is the floor, so if NCI wants their data elements for some cancer research, which is great, that's their program need, but again, it doesn't make sense for it to be part of a US CDI that is required of all regulated certified health IT. So what we've done is we worked with agencies such as NCI, CMS, CDC, to build out this US CDI plus data set, and they may be at various maturity level, but the key thing here is that they are non-regulated. Really, the driver for adoption of these USDI plus elements will be these program incentives coming from various agencies. And that's really how we see it built out. And over the years, as they get mature, it could become part of USCDI, depending on its applicability. Uh, again, so this is like out of the whole list. I'm going to pick a few here. Actually, I'm going to just talk about our work with HERS, uh, uh, the Health Resources and Service Administration, which is very exciting because that's an implementation-focused work which, which I want to talk about. And then I'll talk a little bit about our work on behavioral health because those are some of the newest engagements that we have not yet uh, publicly talked about a whole lot. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, just talking a little bit about the work we have done with HERSA over the last several years, one of the things that really was exciting for us is HRSA had this program, which is called the Uniform Doc Data System, which is really a program where uh, federally qualified health centers submit their quality reports to HRSA every year on an annual front. It was using older technology, and one of the things we wanted to push on was to see if they could leverage modern FIRES implementation guides and implement them. Where is Iwat? I know in the morning Iwat talked about implementation. This is an example of, of real implementation of FIRES standards that are happening the, by federal agency uh, desire working with, with, with the contractors and the EHR community. Uh, I'm pleased to announce that um, that the EHR vendors who participate in the programs really stepped up and have implemented these standards. Some of this you see here are not even required as of now. They are kind of coming up in the future, but they have both uh, implemented it, but also provided uh, important feedback such as on issues like scalability, performance, and the like that are all going to be hopefully uh, brought back into the standards community for, for its uh, uh, for, for upgrades to the standards. So I'm very excited and, and, and look forward to the next iteration. And again, uh, our future uh, direction on USCDI Plus is to kind of enable it to be implemented by federal agency programs. Uh, now I'm going to talk about some of the other work that ONC does. Again, we talked about USCDI Plus as a service that ONC provides to federal agencies for their data needs. We also know within HHS, 
we procure a lot of health IT as a broad agency. Uh, and one of the things that uh, we as a secretary wanted to do was to make sure that uh, the procurement of health IT tools are all aligned with the standards that are also required of certifications. Again, the idea here being like eating your own dog food. Like if we require of the regulated industry to build and, and, and standards, we ought to be also making sure we use the standards. And the policy that has been put in place since July of 2022 is this health IT alignment policy where the secretary has required all the different agencies to first look at standards that have been published through HHS, namely ONC standards, to make sure that if they can be used, to use those standards. And as an example, which is really some of the important work that ONC is doing, is in the area of health IT adoption for behavioral health. And again, behavioral health is an area where it's both, there's, a, there's an acute need, at least in USA, but also when the meaningful use dollars came in, there was no incentive, the, the, meaning, the behavioral health providers didn't get incentives to, to build out health, to use the health IT geared towards behavioral health. So again, this is an opportunity for us over the past year or so, we obtained over $20 million coming from uh, the federal agency SAMHSA, which is really the lead agency uh, driving behavioral health programs to leverage health IT for use in behavioral health. And again, this is something we'll be working over the next several years to build out a data set whereby behavioral health information could be exchanged with primary care, uh, primary care dis uh, data sets. And again, these are complex consent, privacy, security issues that we need to deal with. But we are excited about it. It's going, we are going to release. We had a behavioral health data set that got uh, published for co from comment period. Uh, I think public commented on it. We are now looking at it to come up with an initial set that will publish and then incentivize it through SAMHSA work and through some of the other incentives that other agencies like CMS through their advanced payment programs are able to provide. I also wanted to highlight one more uh, opportunity for all of you, which is our leading edge accelerator project, the LEAP project, which is an ONC instituted grant cooperative agreement. And this year's, uh, it's basically a grant, we kind of come up with a high level topic and we, we give freedom for the industry at large to build out a solution. And in this year's LEAP uh, program, we have an area of interest that's geared towards developing lightweight health IT solutions that can bridge between clinical care and behavioral health. And it's a hint, hint, lightweight health IT solutions. Is, is we are really looking forward to some cool, innovative solutions that are kind of much more based on modern API technology stacks. And again, you look at the application date and, and deadlines, there is clearly time. If you are interested in here learning more about LEAP, we have uh, folks from ONC who are here who can talk to you and, 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 and just navigate you through the process if you have not applied ever. Uh, it's open to all. Uh, you don't have to be an academic institution or a, or, or a non-profit. It's really open to everybody to apply and we look forward to, uh, to, to seeing more applications in this area. Very briefly on one more new area that ONC is working on, which is really fresh off, like I should say the oven. We haven't really begun a lot of discussion, which is uh, HHS uh, also has a data strategy, which they published 2000 at the end of uh, last year. And one of the key things was there was a desire and, and a gap noted in there that uh, that needed to be interoperability between health and human services. As you can imagine, we have the Department of Health and Human Services. We have a whole lot of things that are happening in the human services, which uh, you, can, you can argue is much more relevant to healthcare than really the acute healthcare diseases are and are really important for, for the whole person care. And one of the key areas that uh, this strategy has uh, requires ONC now as a lead agency to do is develop a, 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 a health IT uh, capability that is going to be essentially interoperating between human services and healthcare data. And this is an area we just started discussing. Uh, please look forward to additional communication. We are hoping to uh, organize a summit of sorts that brings those two communities together so that people can start talking about how fire standard, which is, which is based on patient, can be expanded to include whole patient care, which is, again, a, 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 a area where I'm, I'm, we are glad to defer to the standards experts to, to, to navigate. Uh, let me see the timing. I have about uh, five minutes. I'll cover TEFCA, and then, then, then I'll, I'll, I'll leave it for questions. 
Very briefly on TEFCA, again, it starts with our uh, law. So in the 21st century, uh, the Cures Act, there was a requirement for ONC to develop a framework of governance at the network level, not just at the data level. You can imagine the need for, for each, if each EHR is connected to every EHR, it's going to be a point-to-point, -point, very complicated. The idea of, of TEFCA was to see if there was a hub and scope model. Here, the goal is very basic. Uh, it's purely to make sure that there is a basic connectivity of any provider to, to be able to get data across the nation. And again, this is very US-centric uh, focus, so folks who are from international uh, countries, please uh, apologies if, 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 if this does not directly uh, replicate to your, your uh, country's goals. But here in, in US, the idea was that as long as we could come up with, as government agency, we could come up with, with a rules of road and, and, and standardize some basic connectivity, then that establishes a universal, a, a technical floor, and then really industry, all of you and, 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 and the users could build out the last mile of what is needed to support those patients. Again, ONC's interest is, is not so much as building a cool tool, but to make sure that the rules of road are standard so that uh, industry can innovate. And I think we heard at, uh, in the morning call how a, a $40 billion investment really resulted in an in a order of magnitude investment from the private sector. And that's something we are, we are excited about and interested in. Again, I won't go through the details of it. The main thing to kind of we are focusing on is think of the big box, big circles in the middle as your aggregators of, of like, you know, think of them as like, if I look at the the telecommunication industry, they are the Verizons, at and and the T-Mobiles of the world. They are the ones who will negotiate all the traffic between the different uh, uh, providers or, 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 or connection points. And all the smaller circles are the edges, like the, the ones, the provider, single provider practice, or the hospitals. The idea here is that small provider be able to connect to any other provider because the actual navigation between them would be would be done by these uh, QHINs, we are the qualified health information networks that really have stepped up to both provide this capability, they have expanded uh, and at the role of what standards they will use, they are using specific standards that will help them negotiate between each other to make sure that it's all hidden to the, to the, to the end users, the providers of sorts. And we have, TEFCA is operational. I mean, TEFCA is not just a glean in our eye. It is actually a real thing. We have uh, seven qualified information, health information networks that are actually live. They are just QHINs. They are not applicant and proposed and all that. They are real QHINs. They are getting providers. They're exchanging data. This is a list. And the connection to FIRE, which is really exciting for me, is uh, they are really starting to, like this year is when we are going to upgrade the TEFCA connectivity to essentially build out a fire approach for connecting uh, the providers and connecting these health information, health information networks because really that's what industry asked us to do. They were all building off fire and they didn't want to build on an older stack. So the first thing is we did publish a roadmap with TEFCA which are now implementing uh, it's called the FIRE Roadmap for TEFCA Exchange. If you read it, it's got some government complexity of what is a facilitated FIRE versus broker FIRE. It's, you know, in government you learn that uh, terminologies always get confusing, but if you separate that, the whole idea here is to be able to leverage the existing certified EHR capability to be able to use FIRE APIs as efficiently as possible. And finally, uh, TEFCA comes with an agreement among the, Q, among the qualified uh, health information networks, and the version two that was released in May really requires them to support FIRE. So again, FIRE and the network level is coming to you in this year is, is kind of the, the theme I will, I will leave you with. So finally, to summarize, uh, I gave a lot of uh, like insights on, on, on ONC's approach, but uh, one of the things I'll, I'll, I'll mention is ONC will continue to expand fire capabilities in our future rules. Uh, again, uh, you know, we have HTI-1, Kios rule. We talk probably about uh, uh, working on our next rule, which obviously, uh, you know, will, will have this uh, fire first uh, approach. Uh, USDI plus will continue to expand, and, and really it's an area where we, we would like to kind of like have you encourage to work with us and federal agencies to be able to uh, support it. Human services is an area where 
interoperability with human services is, 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 is extreme high priority for us that we'll be working on this year. And finally, uh, network exchange using fire is, is also a key priority. So this is kind of the area where ONC is focused on. We blog a lot, so read our blogs on, on our Health IT website to know where ONC is going. And I thank you for uh, uh, listening to me, and I think I have about five minutes for questions. Thank you very much with that. Yes, sir. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'll just like broadly, the question, just to kind of uh, repeat the question, wanted to talk a little bit about uh, our Inferno test kit uh, expansion and what it does. So Inferno is a test kit. It's a test tool, open source test tool that ONC funds. And we created it, gosh, around during the meaningful use time, I would say, when Fire APIs were just being built. And we have two versions of it. One is a program edition that really caters towards what's required in certification. So health IT developers, when they go for certification, those are, there's, a, there's a version of the toolkit that the test labs use. They will run through them, and, and, and if they pass, you get certified. But we have a whole host of, of needs we found from implementation guide developers on making sure that those IG conformance requirements that are put in the standards, those are tested by developers as they build the tool or also by standards community to make sure that the standards work. So that's where we have expanded our Inferno toolkit. Again, open source, available for, for industry to download it, use it at your own place. And what we did recently was, as of today, was we expanded to increase it, uh, to expand the, the to capabilities to include many of the DaVinci uh, implementation guides that are very critical for some of the key payer provider use cases like e -prior auth and uh, ePriorauth was a big thing. So we have, uh, there are document uh, template requirements, coverage requirements, and ePriorauth uh, requirements that are all being worked on for the last, I would say, four or five years by DaVinci. They are all now part of the tools. So any developer who's building on those IGs are implementing, you can leverage this test kit to make sure, A, uh, that you are compliant with an IG, and also, if there are issues with the IG in terms of clarification, reach out to uh, Inferno team, and we can route it to the stance community. So very exciting, and that hopefully is a pathway towards future. Yeah, hi. Um, could you talk a little bit about how Tefka um, conforms to HIPAA? Because there seems to be some issues there that I'd like to hear you discuss. Thanks. So at a high level, and, and again, I'm glad you asked the question. That was, that was not a setup. Uh, TEFCA does not change applicable law. So just to be kind of very clear, uh, all exchange happening on TEFCA is happening using applicable law. And I say applicable law because in broadly there are, in US at least, there's HIPAA as a floor. States have their own laws. And all those are, are really, uh, none of it is, is, is trumped by TEFCA. All TEFCA does is makes it easier if you, are, if you are sending data or you are able to, to send the data, it makes it much easier to be able to find the patient, find the clinician, and to be able to send that data. So we are, again, bro broadly like TEFCA is looking at those exchange purpose of use, uh, treatment operations, and all that. Uh, in our first iteration, we have, uh, we have released TEFCA as a, any of the QHINs that exchange data have to support the treatment exchange purpose of use, and an individual access services use, which is really like patients' rights of access to their data. And the qualified hints are working on expanding that capability for, for operations, and, and, and healthcare operations are the big thing uh, that, that is going on. And then obviously we want to expand to research also. Hopefully that addresses, but again, bottom line, it does not trump HIPAA, HIPAA and other applicable laws. It's all aligned with it. Yes. I just want to take 15 seconds. I'm Viet Nguyen uh, with the HL7. I'm the Chief Standards Implementation Officer, and Dan Vreeman up there is our Chief Standards Development Officer. And we just want to acknowledge and thank ONC, really, and along with the other agencies for all their support for advancing FIRE through their, their funding in, in projects. Without this kind of support, we, it's difficult to find um, funding to, to get the subject matter expertise uh, folks to really advance some of the work we, we've done. So thank you.
Well, this is not a setup, okay? <laughs> I'll just say that. I appreciate it. Yes. Yes, um, I just wanted to ask for um, app developers. It's great that we have fire endpoints, and but it's really hard to know which endpoints go with which organization, and also the endpoints uh, constantly change. Is there a way, we, in, a way in which we can have a centralized place where <sighs> app developers can just say, "Hey, give me whatever endpoint for whatever clinic"? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, and yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll answer briefly in the 30 seconds I have. Yes, HDI. We we heard that. When we published it, people were saying, like, what, I don't understand API 4.4, what, which provider it is. So HTI1, the rule that's got, that we published, has a requirement for health IT developers to publish on their websites in a known place uh, the fire endpoint resource, organization resource, and I'm missing, I think we also published it as a bundle. So at least it's computable, machine-readable format. So that's the first thing. That's kind of step one. We are moving towards user access brands, so you know all the capabilities will be there. And the other yes of centralization, I'll say uh, we have a health IT a product. We have a website called CHPL, Chapel, we call it, a Certified Health IT Product List. That has in one of their requirements a documentation of that certified health IT providers have to provide the links where the URLs are going to be put up. So in a certain sense, it's not as clean as here's a list of service-based URLs, but what you get is between these, I think you can navigate to find a machine-readable uh, set. And we have a, a tool called Lantern, which I did not talk about, which was our attempt during the after the cures rule to, to kind of start looking at endpoints and be able to publicize them. So we are looking at using Lantern as a way for ONC to do the collection centralization uh, that is not with the like outside of regulations, if at all it makes sense to you all. But making our life e making lives easier of app developers is a key key priority for ONC, if at all, <laughs> you know. And and we are, we are taking baby steps. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for for your attention. I I, I look forward to uh, the devs. We have a lot of ONC ONCers in the in the sessions, so please uh, check with them and ask any questions you have about anything. They'll, they'll be more than happy to uh, respond. Thank you again for your attention. Thank you.